Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Displayed are the list of news articles taken for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description and also in the comment section for the benefit of mobile phone viewers. Now let's move on to the analysis of first news article. This editorial article talks about the need and importance of state intervention in agriculture, particularly in agricultural markets. In this analysis, we will discuss what is the need for state intervention, then what are the specific characteristics and socio-historical context of Indian agriculture, then the need of the earth to tackle some issues that we are going to discuss in this analysis. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. First, what is the need for state intervention? See, the main need is because of specific characteristics and socio-historical context of Indian agriculture. So, first let us see what are these characteristics and context or conditions. See, agriculture itself has a variety of limiting factors. There are uncertainties of weather, soil fertility, water availability. Weather is important because the most well-known source of water for plant growth is rainwater. And without water, crops cannot grow. So here water availability in addition to weather is important. Then soil fertility refers to ability of a soil to sustain plant growth by providing essential plant nutrients. It also includes having favorable chemical, physical and biological characteristics as a habitat for plant growth. So all this contribute in the cultivation of a healthy food crop. Now what is the challenge is that all these factors change according to available environmental conditions. Now, because of these factors, increasing returns to scale is also very difficult to achieve, unlike the case of industries or firms. When we say returns to scale, it refers to quantitative change in the output of a firm or industry that results from a proportionate increase in all inputs. But what happens in agriculture, for instance, even if inputs such as fertilizer, pesticides, improved seed are provided, if there is no water availability, then there will not be enough harvest. Same is also the case with economies of scale. Economies of scale refer to the cost advantage that is experienced by a firm when it increases its level of output. Here advantage is because of the inverse relationship between per unit fixed cost and the quantity produced. See greater the quantity of output produced, the lower the per unit fixed cost because costs are spread over a large number of goods. Here unit cost refers to total expenditure incurred by a company to produce, to store and to sell one unit of a particular product or service. So using this, producers in industry make profits by cutting unit costs. But the same thing cannot be applied in agriculture where we see most of them as small and marginal farmers. And mostly their family members do the unskilled manual labor in farming and therefore increasing their production is limited and that too subject to the farmers overwork and self-exploitation. Next, even in the production processes also, agriculture varies from that of a firm because agriculture depends on climatic annual cycle. To be very specific, it depends on appropriate phase of climatic annual cycle. So harvesting is done by farmers at the same time. This results in abundant harvest of same or similar crops at a particular time. Now you may think that they can harvest and store in warehouses for future sale. But as we saw already, most of them are small and marginal farmers. According to author, they constitute 86% of India's farmers. So they cannot afford warehousing facilities and therefore they are forced to do sell the harvest immediately. And here, even if there is increased harvest, the demand does not change because the demand for food crops is price inelastic. Now, this means whether the price goes up or down, consumers buying habits remains the same. So that means farmers always or inevitably have to sell their produce or harvest at a low price. Now, in an unregulated market, this abundant harvest is bought and hoarded by traders and later they will sell it to consumers with high prices. So, in an unregulated market, both farmers and consumers are affected. So, among all these issues, farmers are in loss because they do not get the remunerative price for their produce. Therefore, they fall into the hands of money lenders for funding their future input needs. What they do? Moneylenders exploit farmers with excessive, exorbitant interest rate for loans. So now farmers are in the vicious cycle of debt trap. So according to author, this debt trap is further enhanced 
because the markets are interlocked or connected see most often the traders themselves are the money lenders they are the input suppliers or crop buyers or labor employees or landlessers and these are people who use exploitative practices so end of the day the farmer has no escape from these people and falls into the death trap of debt trap so all these specific characteristics and context they mandate state intervention particularly in multiple agricultural markets this is required to ensure the welfare of both farmers and consumers so it is in line with this goal only government has already established statutory regulatory and recommendatory bodies in the agricultural sector especially establishing these bodies were important in the advent of green revolution see green revolution was a new strategy that was adopted in agriculture and it refers to large increase in production of food grains because of use of high yielding variety seeds particularly for wheat and rice the use of high yield variety seeds they required use of fertilizer and pesticide in the correct quantities along with regular supply of water here the first phase of green revolution was approximately from mid 1960s up to mid 1970s and the second phase was from mid 1970s to mid 1980s the spread of green revolution technology it helped in achieving surplus production and it enabled india to achieve self sufficiency in food grains from being suffering from ship to mouth existence so to protect farmers from loss government established bodies that mainly include food corporation of india then commission for agricultural costs and prices we discussed about food corporation of india on 1st april now coming to commission for agricultural costs and prices see it is a body that is established based on resolution of government of india in the year 1965 and it is an attached office of union ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare it is mandated to recommend minimum support prices the purpose is to incentivize the cultivators to adopt modern technology then to raise productivity and overall grain production in line with emerging demand patterns in the country so there is an assurance of remunerative and stable price environment because of minimum support prices for the surplus production now as a result of this the issue of unstable marketplace and market prices for the agriculture produce is addressed often the unstable marketplace and prices they inflict undue losses on the crop growers but note that not all the crops or commodities are covered under minimum support price scheme so food corporation of india procures specified food grains at msps and this is known as public procurement and these are distributed among the poorer sections of the society through the public distribution system so here the government intervention has protected both farmers and also consumers particularly from the poorer section of the society but was green revolution all for good that would be factually incorrect because along with many benefits it also carried some risks that also increased the misery of farmers it allegedly caused drying of aquifers as a result there was steady decline in water tables then it caused land degradation and there was declined water quality because of overuse of chemicals there were also few other issues now the aquifers dried because farmers continued to grow the water intensive crops of rice wheat and sugarcane and according to author 90% of india's water is consumed in farming these crops now why farmers grow only these crops this is because of the assured market and assured minimum support price In addition to this farmers majorly started cultivating only the MSP crops so other crops are not given importance also farmers who are cultivating non MSP crops they do not get the benefit of assured market so these are other issues that are faced by farmers so what is the need of tower to tackle these issues see first is to cover more farmers for this there is a need to expand the basket of public procurement to include more crops this measure itself will provide higher and more sustainable farmer incomes and also greater water security because if cropping patterns are diversified so as to include a variety of crops like millets or nutri cereals or pulses or oil seeds then experts are saying that huge volumes of water could be saved so to encourage this production government can assure that it will procure 25% of actual production of these crops for a particular season second is we require public investment in agriculture particularly it is needed for those crops that are grown through natural farming and third important suggestion is expanding government mandates 
why this is required this is to ensure safeguarding of farmers from exploitation by large retailers and also to ensure that most of the farm produce passes through mandis how it should be expanded see the farmers should be provided with access to mandis within a radius of 5 kilometers and these mandis should be having transparent and farmer friendly functioning and given this geographical criteria if we have to go with this suggestion india will require 42000 mandis but currently there are around less than 3000 so we require 14 times this particular number to ensure that this particular suggestion is fulfilled now why we have such geographical criterion for mandis this is to ensure that there are no middlemen and also there is reduced transportation and other costs so these measures are suggested to ensure the welfare of farmers So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article. In this analysis, we saw why state intervention is required. We saw about specific characteristics of Indian agriculture. We saw few information about green revolution, commission for agricultural costs and prices. Then we saw few suggestions to tackle the discussed issues. Now let's move on to next article discussion. This news is about the French Open tennis tournament. See the French Open tennis tournament will be delayed by one week because of coronavirus pandemic. It was set to start on May 23, but now it is expected to start on May 30. Let us use this article as an opportunity to learn about the Grand Slams of tennis. Some of you might be thinking why this article See we should be well prepared for prelims and know that prelims is about learning something about everything and mains is about learning everything about something this is what sankar sir used to say and we must hope for the best and should also prepare for the worst so today we will see something which is relevant from tennis that may feature in prelims exam See there are four grand slam tournaments in tennis they are australian open french open Wimbledon and US Open these events are also called as majors because they are the biggest tennis events of the year first let us see about Australian Open it was initiated in 1905 it is held annually in Melbourne in Australia during the month of January it is played on hard courts when we say hard courts these are typically made of rigid materials like asphalt or concrete in addition to that they are also covered with acrylic resins The purpose is to seal the surface and to mark the playing lines. These resins also provide some cushioning effect to the game. See Australian Open was the first Grand Slam tournament to feature indoor play during wet weather or during extreme heat. This was made possible because the courts are equipped with retractable roofs. So these are some information about Australian Open. Now let us see about French Open. The French Open was started in 1891. It is also known as Roland Garros tournament. It is usually held between late May and early June. It is held in Paris in France. This tournament is played on clay courts. Because of the clay courts, this event is widely considered to be the most physically demanding tennis tournament in the world. In addition to this, Roland Garros or the French Open is currently the only major open sport that is held on clay. Now let us move on to Wimbledon which was initiated in 1877. Wimbledon is a grass court tennis grand slam event. It is the oldest of all four of the grand slam tennis events. Wimbledon is looked at by many experts in the tennis world as the most prestigious event. It is usually held from late June to early July. Also know that since its year of inception Wimbledon has been held at the All England Club that is located in Wimbledon in London. Now let's come to US Open. The history dates back to 1881. It is being held annually. It starts on the last Monday in August and it continues for 2 weeks into September. This tournament is played on a hard court. So these are some of the important information with reference to tennis wherein mainly we focused about the four grand slams of tennis. mainly you know about when it started whether it is held annually in which period in the year the event is held and the type of court whether it is hard court or it is clay court or grass court now let's move on to the analysis of next news article 
Now see this news article which talks about the decision of the Supreme Court with reference to a red petition that prayed to pass an order to direct the government to provide basic human amenities to the members of detained persons of Rohingya community who have taken refuge in India and who also claim to have registered as refugees with UN High Commission for Refugees. The petition has sought for the release of detained Rohingya refugees and also a direction to the government not to deport the Rohingya refugees who have been detained in Jammu. In relation to this, the court acknowledged that though rights to equality and due process of law enshrined in the constitution are available to both citizens and foreigners, a right not to be deported is ancillary to Article 191E. See, Article 191E, it guarantees every citizen of India the right to reside and to settle in any part of the Indian territory. So, in this case, what do we mean when the court said a right not to be deported is ancillary or concomitant to Article 191E? Here, the word concomitant or ancillary refers to something that is naturally associated with or something that is naturally accompanying. So, what they have said, right not to be deported is naturally associated with Article 191E. That is, a person who has the right to reside and settle in any part of Indian territory has the natural right of not to be deported. Directly saying, such right is not available to others who are foreigners. So, that is the meaning. Court also insisted that they should not be deported without proper procedure. So, what is proper procedure? See, Government of India generally follows procedure of notifying the government of country of origin of the said foreigners. In this case, Myanmar. So, first Government of India will notify Myanmar government. And the central government will order for deportation of these refugees or foreigners only when they are confirmed by the Myanmar government or the government of country of origin that the particular persons are citizens or nationals of that country and that they are entitled to come back. Only then government deports them. So that is the proper procedure. So in this light, let us discuss about fundamental rights that are available only for Indians and those which are available for both Indians and foreigners as a matter of right, something that can be claimed as a right. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. See, rights refer to the recognized claims of an individual that are essential for the development of her or his own self. Some of the most important rights are recognized by the state and they are enshrined in the Constitution of India. Certain rights are called as fundamental rights. They are said to be fundamental because they are guaranteed by the Constitution as a fundamental right. Under Part 3, then they are also justiciable. That is, in case of violation, the individual can approach courts for their protection, say Supreme Court under Article 32 as part of constitutional remedy and High Courts under Article 226 for remedy. So the constitution offers all citizens some basic freedoms or rights individually and collectively in Part 3 of Indian Constitution. The constitution guarantees in the form of six broad categories that are included under Article 12 to Article 35. Right to equality, then right to freedom, then right against exploitation, then right to freedom of religion, cultural and educational rights, then the right to constitutional remedies. Originally, right to property was also part of fundamental rights, but it was later removed through the 44th constitutional amendment. It was removed as it was found that it hindered the goal of socialism that is Indian Socialism. So at present it is considered as a legal constitutional right under Article 300 capital A. And among these fundamental rights, some of them are available only to Indian citizens. These are Article 15, 16, 19, 29 and 30. Apart from these, other fundamental rights that are displayed here, these are applicable to everybody except enemy aliens. Everybody in the sense they are applicable even for foreigners. The only condition is that they should not be enemy aliens. When we say enemy aliens, these are people whose country is at war with India. It also refers to Indian citizens who voluntarily reside in that particular country or the enemy state or who voluntarily trades with such enemy state at the time of war. So these are some information related to the rights that are applicable only to citizens and those rights that are applicable also to foreigners. Now let us extend our discussion to the reasoning behind the petitioners and the argument of the government about deportation of these refugees who are in question. The petitioners argued that India should not deport the refugees because the situation currently in Myanmar is not in good shape. As we know that democratic government or the democratic processes were not respected currently by the Myanmar government as it is taken over by the military junta. 
then the petitioners argued that though india is not a signatory to un convention on status of refugees of 1951 since it is a party to udhr the international covenant on civil and political rights the international covenant on rights of child therefore india should follow the principle of non refoulement what is principle of non refoulement see under principle of non refoulement state should not deport or transfer individuals from their jurisdiction to another country or another place if the particular sending state believes that these persons they face a risk or harm or persecution or torture at the country or place to which they are to be deported or to be sent and the petitioners also took note of judgment of international court of justice in the gambia versus myanmar case which was issued on 23 january 2020 they showed that even the international court has taken note of genocide of rohingyas in myanmar and that their lives are in serious danger if they are deported however the government of india stated that there is a continuous threat of influx of illegal immigrants to india as india has open or porous land borders with many countries such influx pose serious national security ramifications and it also reported that there is organized and well orchestrated influx of illegal immigrants through agents and touts for monetary considerations and it also has the power under foreigners act through section 3 which empowers central government to issue orders for prohibiting regulating or restricting entries of foreigners into india or their departure from india and it also argued that though the rights guaranteed under article 14 and 21 may be available to even non citizens the fundamental right to reside and settle in this country is guaranteed under article 191e is available only to the citizens and also quoted few other earlier orders of the supreme court where it rejected an application challenging deportation of rohingyas from assam and that india follows a proper procedure of deportation that is deportation is carried out only when they are confirmed by the country of origin as they are persons who are their citizens then only they will be deported and with respect to the present state of affairs in myanmar supreme court held that we cannot comment upon something happening in another country so in the end supreme court held that it is not possible to grant interim relief that is requested in the petition and it made clear that rohingya refugees in jammu shall not be deported unless the procedure prescribed for such deportation is followed so these are some of the important information with reference to the analysis of this news article we saw about the fundamental rights rights that are available to indian citizens and rights that are also available to foreigners but except enemy aliens then we saw the arguments that are made with reference to the case called as mohammed salimullah versus union of india and others and the arguments of indian government and the petitioners with reference to the deportation related to rohingya refugees now let's move on to the analysis of next news article these two articles are in the context of commemorating the 400th birth anniversary of sikh guru tek bahadur in this context the prime minister of india has said that there is need for research and documentation about the social service aspect of sikhism In this context let us discuss in detail about Sikhism we'll also discuss about the Sikh gurus and their contribution in chronological order the syllabus relevant for the analysis of this article is highlighted here for your reference see Sikhism is the world's fifth largest religion this word Sikh it means a learner or a seeker of truth know that Sikhism advocates equality social justice service to humanity and very importantly tolerance for other religions the religion was founded by guru nanak dev at the beginning of the 16th century guru nanak was born in 1469 he died in 1539 after his death he was followed by nine other gurus Guru Angad Dev was guru for 13 years from 1539 to 1552 his contribution is that he created a new script called as Gurmukhi and he gave Sikhs a written language after his death Guru Amar Das followed he showed great devotion and uh, the special feature is that he made the langar or the community kitchen as an integral part of Sikhism in delhi in bangla sahib and in other parts of india uh, civil service aspirants and other exam aspirants they would have gone at least once to have langar or the divine food from such community kitchens persons from all religions are actually welcome then guru ramdas ji he took over as the fourth guru he composed hymns they were later incorporated in the sacred writings related to sikhism 
then guru arjan dev ji he became the fifth guru he built the world famous harmandar sahib and this is popularly known as the golden temple in amritsar he also compiled a sacred religious book for the sikhs called as holy granth sahib the guru suffered martyrdom in 1606 and he was followed by guru har gobind he maintained a standing army and he symbolically wore two swords one representing spiritual power and other representing temporal power and he was followed by guru har rai he was the seventh guru he was born in 1630 and spent most of his life in devotional meditation and in preaching the teachings of guru nanak ji he passed away in 1661 and he ordained a kind of nomination his second son har krishan as the next guru Guru Har Krishan gave his life while serving the people in Delhi who were epidemic stricken. It is important to note that the place where he had his last breath is where we have the renowned Gurudwara Bangla Sahib which is in Delhi. He is followed by Guru Tegh Bahadur who became the ninth Sikh Guru in 1664. See at that period of time Mughal governor of Kashmir resorted to forcible conversion of persons belonging to Hindu religion and who decided to fight it out it is Guru Tegh Bahadur and thereby he came into conflict with Mughal authorities how and why because he gave aid and shelter to some Hindu men from Kashmir they actually sought his help from forced conversion later because of all these events he was arrested and decapitated or beheaded based on the orders of aurangzeb and very importantly we should note that today the discussion is about guru tegh bahadur he is widely respected as a person who gave his life for a religion which is not his own religion that is a special note about this guru see the gurudwara siskanj in delhi it stands at the place of guru sahib's martyrdom and the gurudwara rakabganj stands at the place of his cremation he is followed by the 10th guru guru gobind singh he became guru after the martyrdom of his father guru tegh bahadur and the special thing about guru gobind singh is that at the time of his death he invested guru granth sahib that is the sacred holy book of sikhs as the supreme head of the sikhs thereby he brought the practice of nominating a religious head to a grinding halt finally know that there are amritdari sikhs and sahajdari sikhs sikhs who have not gone through amrit sanskar initiation ceremony they are known as sahajdari sikhs they have not been initiated into the khalsa then who are amritdari sikhs see they are individuals who have gone through the amrit sanskar initiation ceremony these sikhs they belong to the khalsa they must wear five signs of their faith known as five k's they are kirpan which is a small sized sword that is placed in a shoulder belt you can even see women having this small sword then kara which is an iron bangle worn on the wrist then kacha which is a cotton underwear you can closely see related with boxer shorts then kanga which is a small wooden comb and kesh or uncut hair so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article we saw about sikhism and also the sikh gurus and their contribution in chronological order now let's move on to the analysis of next news article this news article is about a recent order given by national company law appellate tribunal the order was related to the formation of a committee of creditors under the insolvency and bankruptcy code against oyo hotels in this context let us discuss in brief about nclt and nclat see national company law tribunal it was established under section 408 of companies act of 2013 it was established for the purpose of adjudication of corporate civil disputes particularly under two legislations one is companies act of 2013 then the other is insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016 now this nclt is a specialist body it has both judicial and technical members now let's discuss its functioning with an example say a company have not paid dues to its creditors so the party involved can take this issue of non payment of dues to nclt following this the nclt will give its judgment suppose a party to the dispute is not satisfied with the judgment given by national company law tribunal then the party can approach the appellate tribunal which is called as national company law appellate tribunal here we must know that nclat or the national company law appellate tribunal was constituted under section 410 of companies act 2013 
so both nclt and nclat they are statutory bodies now the main function of nclat is hearing appeals against the orders of national company law tribunal in addition to this nclat is also the appellate tribunal to hear and dispose appeals against any order on awarding compensation that is passed by competition commission of india then nclat is also the appellate tribunal for hearing appeals against the orders passed by insolvency and bankruptcy board of india particularly under section 202 and 211 of ibc code and is nclat is the final stage of appeal the answer is no any person aggrieved by the order of appellate tribunal may file an appeal to the supreme court if there is a question of law arises from such order see usually an appeal has to be filed in the supreme court within 45 days however supreme court may allow the appeal to be filed within a further period of not exceeding 15 days if it is satisfied that the person was prevented by a sufficient cause know that no civil court shall have jurisdiction to entertain any suit or proceedings on any matter on which national company law tribunal or the nclat has jurisdiction under the ibc code now this ibc code it provides safeguard against fraudulent or malicious initiation of proceedings for example if a person initiates insolvency resolution process fraudulently or with malicious intent other than the resolution of insolvency then the adjudicating authority may impose a penalty such a penalty shall not be less than 1 lakh rupees but may extend up to 1 crore rupees so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article wherein we discussed about nclt and clat a few provisions from ibc now let's move on to next part of the discussion this news article mentions that an elephant has died due to alleged ill treatment by a temple board in trivancrum it is said that the elephant was injured by its mahout who is the person who works with the elephant and rides an elephant then the elephant was denied rest and proper medication and it was also paraded in a festival in another temple these allegations reportedly been confirmed by a member of animal welfare board of india so this has provoked anger among the animal rights activists and devotees of the temple as well so in this context let us see in brief about animal welfare board of india see it is a statutory body that was established in the year 1962 this is done under section 4 of prevention of cruelty to animals act of 1960 it is established for the promotion of animal welfare in general and in particular for the purpose of protecting animals from being subjected to unnecessary pain or suffering so it promotes animal welfare in the nation it is also an advisory body on animal welfare laws see it started under the stewardship of late shrimati rukmani devi arundale who was a well known humanitarian and another special information is that she was the first nominated women member of rajya sabha it comes under the aegis of ministry of fisheries animal husbandry and dairying its objectives include ensuring animal welfare laws are diligently followed then providing grants to animal welfare organizations and advising government of india on animal welfare issues so in line with its objectives these are its functions in addition to these functions the board also grants recognition to the newly started animal welfare organizations then the animal welfare organizations has to agree to nominate a representative of animal welfare board of india on its managing or executive committee and the organization has to agree also for regular inspection of its functioning after the inspection if the inspection report of the new animal welfare organization is found to be satisfactory then they will be considered for grant of recognition by animal welfare board of india after this the board will provide financial assistance to the recognized animal welfare organizations now coming to the composition of the board it consists of 28 members inspector general of forests and animal husbandry commissioner to the government of india they are ex officio members then it includes 6 mps out of which four are to be elected by lok sabha and two by the rajya sabha the term of office of members in this board is for a period of 3 years so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article in this article we saw about the issue that is reported in the article then about animal welfare board of india the objectives functions and the composition and also about recognition of animal welfare organizations now let's move on to next part of the discussion Now this news article is about the yellow warning issued by Indian Meteorological Department on Ernakulam, Idukki and Wayanad districts in Kerala. This is because of possibility of isolated heavy rainfall. So in this slide let us learn about the color coded weather warnings and also brief we will also see about IMD. See often in news we come across 
IMD issuing color coded alerts or warnings to particular districts in a state these warnings are mainly meant for administrators to keep ready and to position their resources to handle situations that arises out of weather related disastrous events usually four color codes are used by amd to provide inputs to disaster management authorities for the management of severe weather events they are green yellow orange and red see green stands for no warning that is no action needs to be taken by the authorities and the forecast is of light to moderate rain when it is yellow color it signifies to watch during this warning the authorities are advised to be updated on the situation then comes orange warning during when the authorities are expected to be prepared usually the forecast during an orange warning is of heavy rainfall to very heavy rainfall and finally comes the red warning wherein it asks the authorities to take action this is issued with reference to a forecast for extremely heavy rainfall see imd has earlier clarified that red color warning does not mean red alert rather to take action and when weather warnings are displayed in the map form if a red color is shown over a particular state it does not mean that the entire state is under threat unless or until it is mentioned explicitly and according to imd 15.6 mm to 64.4 mm rain in 24 hours is considered as moderate then 64.5 mm to 115.5 mm is considered as heavy rainfall then 115.6 mm to 204.4 mm is considered as very heavy in 24 hours then more than 204.5 mm in 24 hours is considered as extremely heavy rainfall now let us close this discussion by seeing few information about imd which is the national meteorological service of the country and also the principal government agency in all matters relating to meteorology and allied subjects See, it was established before independence in the year 1875. Its headquarters is in New Delhi. It is headed by Director General of Meteorology. And for the purpose of convenience of administrative and technical control, there are six regional meteorological centers. And at present, IMD functions under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. For your information, the functions of IMD is given, is displayed here for your reference. So these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article. Now let's move on to next part of the discussion. We have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. This question is about green revolution. The question reads, which of the following statements is not correct with reference to green revolution? It refers to the large scale increase in production of food grains resulting from the use of high yielding variety seeds. See, this statement is correct. See, one of the special feature of Green Revolution is that it permanently broke the stagnation that happened in agriculture during the colonial rule. Come to second option. It required the use of inputs such as fertilizer and pesticide in the correct quantities as well as regular supply of water. Then the third option. In the first phase of Green Revolution, the use of high yield variety seeds was restricted to the more affluent states such as Punjab, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. See, both these statements are correct. See, the use of high yield variety seeds, it required the use of fertilizer and pesticide in the correct quantities and also regular supply of water. And the application of these inputs in correct proportions is very important. So this means statement B is correct. So when we have to take care of these aspects, who are the farmers who could be benefited from these seeds? See, those farmers who had reliable irrigation facilities and financial resources to purchase fertilizer and pesticide, they were to be benefited. This is the reason behind why in the first phase of green revolution, the use of high yield variety seeds was restricted to the more affluent states like Punjab, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. So, statement C is also correct. Come to statement 4 or option 4. In the second phase of green revolution, the use of high yield variety seeds primarily benefited wheat growing regions only. This is incorrect. See, in first phase, use of high yield variety seeds primarily benefited the wheat growing regions only. But in second phase only, from mid 1970s to mid 1980s, the high yield variety technology spread to a larger number of states and benefited more variety of crops. So here, statement D or option D is incorrect. Therefore, the correct answer is option D. Now, this question is with reference to NCLAT. Two statements are given. They are asking which of the statements given above are correct. It is a statutory body for hearing appeals against the orders of National Company Law Tribunal. The statement is correct. Now, the second statement, its decision is final and binding and cannot be challenged in any court of law. 
Now, this statement is incorrect because NCLAT is not the final stage of appeal. Any person agreed by the order of NCLAT may file an appeal to the Supreme Court. So, the correct answer for this question is option A. Only the first statement is correct. This question is with reference to Grand Slam events of tennis. Two statements are given. Which of the other statements are correct? US Open is played on a grass court. Then French Open is the oldest of all four of the Grand Slam tennis events. Both the statements are incorrect. See, US Open is played on hard court. It is Wimbledon which is played on a grass court. And it is Wimbledon which is the oldest of all the four of the Grand Slam tennis events. Because it was started in 1877. French Open was started in 1891 only. So, both the statements are incorrect. Correct answer is option D, neither 1 nor 2. See this question, which among the following rights is applicable or available only to Indian citizens? Protection of culture, language and script of minorities, freedom to manage religious affairs, equality of opportunity in matters of public employment, protection against arrest and detention in certain cases, right of minorities to establish and administer educational institutions. Here the correct answer is option A, 1, 3 and 5 only. Consider the following Gurus of Sikhism. Guru Gobind Singh, Guru Tegh Bagadur, Guru Hargobind, Guru Angad Dev. They are asking to arrange the above Gurus in the chronological order starting from the earliest. Here the correct answer is option B, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now see this question on Animal Welfare Board of India. Three statements are given. They are asking which of the statements given above are correct. It is established under the Environment Protection Act of 1986. This is incorrect. See, it was established in 1962 under Section 4 of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act of 1960. Second statement provides grants to animal welfare organizations and advises Government of India on animal welfare issues. This statement is correct. Third statement, the President of India is the Chairman of this board. See, this is incorrect. See, the board consists of 28 members and as per Section 5, Clause 3 of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act of 1960, Central Government shall nominate one of the members of the board to be its chairman and another member of the board to be its vice chairman. And President of India is not its member. Therefore, third statement is also incorrect along with first statement. So, the correct answer is option C, 2 only. See this question. The India Meteorological Department comes under which of the following ministries? The correct answer is Ministry of Earth Sciences. We have given a practice question for mains. You may write the answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we come to the end of today's The Hindu News Analysis. If you like this video, click the like button, comment, share and subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel for more updates and content on civil services exam preparation. Mm -hmm.